How's that? Because <laughs> we, we can't tell if it's if the frame. I sort of saw the light. Can I close it? Every model of Atomics and Atomics is going to be the same as Atomics. And I'm putting 11 in brackets because I don't want to say it. And I want to say C++ is an every model because they never used to have one. So they must be talking about C++ 11. Um, and someday we'll stop using that pre uh, suffix there. And, and we all know which, which C++ we're talking about. So the memory model. This is the memory model. Uh, you've got, this is, when I, when I uh, try to explain to years people that never use them and stuff, I usually use this as how does a computer really work and how does, like, how does an if statement work? Like, well, you know, you write some stuff on here and then you read some stuff and, and even the, you know, even the instruction pointer is part of the memory. Everything's folded in on itself, and it's all in here. And you know, and computers are actually very simple things. And, you, know, you can write your to your memory addresses, and a computer works like a, like a board game, just step by step, right? Um, but we don't care so much about the steps this time. Just this is you know, is this the memory model? This is the memory model that we imagine in our head that we have cells of memory and we write. Them. But the memory model, you know, maybe a bit more like this. It's more complicated than that. It's got you know various levels, and it's okay. That's the org. Um, the uh, you know, it's it's got more. It's got maybe more levels, and it's got more complicated rules. And and maybe this is what the memory model really is. And uh, actually, this isn't quite it either. The memory model is more like this. So you've got you know, 16 spots all at once, trying to play chess with each other. Um, and uh, in Star Trek 2009, there was uh, two concurrent spots, right? And so based on uh, Moore's law, we can predict that <laughs> next Star Trek will have 16 spots. You know, <laughs> you always have to have graphs in your, in your thing. It, it, that's, some, some of that's a bit extrapolated, but. <laughs> uh, and I should also mention that in 68 there was two Spocks for a small time, but one was evil, it didn't really work out. And I think 1984 was the Genesis project, they kind of had a Spock and a half. <coughs> but other than that, you know, I think we're now going to start going up to, get to multiple Spocks. So you know, maybe this is the memory model, and, and uh, oh yeah, you can either say that I'm bad at Photoshop, and that's why all these look exactly the same. Um, or you can, I could claim this is a cache coherency because people always talk about the cache being the problem with, with the memory model and you know, maybe this cache isn't up to date with that cache but in reality caches, most systems have cache coherency so they all look the same. Um, actually I, I was procrastinating so badly on this I wrote a program to generate that image from the other. Um, so really the memory model is something like this where you've got all these processors fighting for the main memory at the back and it's even a little more, you know, oh yeah, there's, there's the one Spock uh, doing stuff, but it's actually kind of like this, where all the Spocks are at, at the same time trying to write the memory. And you'll see something like this, where the, we have two Spocks that are, I don't know, either doing that, you know, thing that the kids do nowadays, do the heart thing, or I think they're trying to write to the same memory location at the same time. That's obviously a bad thing. And these two Spocks, I think, are deadlocked. And one's trying to get away the other, or they're doing MC Etcher, I'm not sure which. Um, the power of the internet, um, you know, I searched for, I need an image that shows two cars turning left and deadlocking. And it's like, yes, someone did that for me already. I don't know who this guy was, but he has a, actually got a pretty good blog on concurrency stuff. Um, and though my only point being that it's amazing that the Ministry of Transportation understands threading and deadlocking enough to say, Blocking an intersection is, is you know, that's, that's technically against the law because when, when this guy blocks the intersection and these guys all back up, or sorry, this guy's, yeah, this guy's blocking the intersection, this guy's blocking the intersection, he can't move, no one can move because everyone's waiting for each other, right? It's a classic thing. Um, so this is kind of what the memory model is, and uh, I think we have one more complication to add to that. What's going on? in this memory model. Um, basically, each Spock is um, 
the problem with the whole memory model is that that, that main memory is kind of slow and, and the local memory is fast, or the CPU is really fast. The CPU is 100 times faster than memory nowadays. Uh, once upon a time, back in the, the, the original series, Star Trek original series, memory was probably the same speed as the CPU, but now uh, the CPU is 100 times faster. So when the CPU wants to write to memory, it doesn't really want to wait for that write to happen. So it just queues it up in a queue even before it gets to the cache and then goes on and, and keeps continuing and, and we get these interesting problems where inside the queue, inside the queue, um, this can get reordered and your reads can come out of the queue instead of coming out of main memory and the CPU can be expected that execution and all these kind of things to try to speed itself up because it really doesn't want to wait for memory. And a uh, CPU is allowed to do all these things as long as it doesn't break on you know, it's the as if rule here, you know. As if my program, I, I, can, I can write X and Y in that order, and the CPU can decide to put it in a different order, and that's fine because it says, there's only one CPU, right? Like, there's no problem if I reorder all these things, because everything will still be consistent, and you won't know the difference. And, um, you know, nowadays there are more than one CPU, there's 16 spots nowadays, and, um, but they just don't talk to each other, they're be ego egocentric, and they just put their blinders on and say, no, no, there's, the rest of the world doesn't exist, I just want to go fast myself. Um, so this is kind of what the real memory model is. But this is the memory model we want, because this memory model we can understand. The other one is like, uh, you know, it's the difference between Newtonian mechanics and Einstein's relativity, where everything's happening, there is no simultaneous, there is no sequence of events. This one's a lot easier to reason with, so this is the memory model we want. Where, you know, one thing goes, and then the other thing goes, and everyone takes a turn using one pencil. Um, but this is what we've got to work with. Um, and in fact, actually though, we also want this, we want both, because um, this is great and all, but this, this is, I can reason about that this is, this is slow and that's fast, and you know, who doesn't want 16 spots, right? Like, the, uh, um, it, you know, the, the problem with this over here is, is it's like, um, Spock. What does? What are the? Do you get any readings from the from the sensors? And Spock has to be captain. I'm unable to read from the sensors due to Chekhov having the pencil. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it, Scotty! We need more pencils down here right now. Hi, Captain, but the, the ship can't take anymore. If we add more pencils, we want to understand what's going on. She's going to break up. <laughs> um, so we want this understandable sequential consistency, and we also want the speed, so we want our cake and it too. And just a bit of precision, what do we mean by sequential consistency? And it's basically, I'll take all your reads and writes from all your threads and say, well, they could happen in any order, so as long as you interleave them in some order, um, that's sequential consistency. So these three threads are working on their own, and they could get mixed up in any order, but you'll never get you'll never get uh, capital C happen before A, at least it won't appear that way, um, because that would be inconsistent. And there's a little more important things about inconsistency. Um, this is another, I don't know who this guy is, but he's got this nice notation I found on the internet for imagining how reads and write patterns in memory. And so the idea of this is I'm writing to X and I'm writing 1. This guy's going to, this is another thread, it's going to read from X and let's, we'll see what the value turns out to be. He's going to do two reads, he's going to do two reads, and he's going to do a write of 2. And let's imagine what might happen, right? So sequential consistency says these could all happen in any order. <coughs> So this is one possible order of what happened. This happened first, these two reads, we don't really care which one happened first because they just read. They could both read one, then this processor might have got a chance to borrow the pencil and write out two, and then the next reads wrote a, uh, read two. So that's one possible interleaving. As it turns out, this is also an allowed interleaving, even though it seems odd. Um, this is also an allowed interleaving because 
it seems odd because what I'm saying is this processor wrote first and this processor wrote before these reads happened. And yes, the read still looks like one and looks like two. And why is this allowed is because this, if, if we see this, basically what's happening is this is a description of what's happening here. You know, we stick a probe on the, this is four processors, this is memory, we all know our little IBM flowchart uh, stencil thing, right? Um, this one's trying to, you know, we put a probe right on the memory uh, bus or something like that. If we have one point in the bus where we can see everything that's going on, we might see this happen. Um, this, say this really did, this is what really happened. But we can't actually see this. There's no way for us to crack open the device and, and do this. Instead, what, all we can do is basically have probes here, right? We can write code that runs on each processor, and then we can try to reason about what's going on. So this is where our our mental model, this is where our code is happening, and what we have to do is, from what we read here, determine what must have happened here. You know? So if we see this happen, we will say, this is what must have happened, right? So there's the one pencil that we're trying to probe, and we get this result. We get, uh, we read one, then we read two, we go, oh, I know what must have happened. This happened in this order, right? And you reason backwards. Whether this really happened or not, that's what we, that's what we, it looks like that's what happened to us. And so the main difference is this is called strict consistency um, versus sequential. This is strict consistency. It's like things really did happen strictly in this order. This is, is, well, it's as if it happened in that order, and you can't tell the difference, so that's fine. Similarly, you know, we could have had things, two, two came first and then one, and we would have determined this must be what happened, right? And so those are sequentially consistent. Each, not together, but each are sequentially consistent, possible, possible interleavings. And then here's another one where we saw one happen and then two, and this guy saw two and two. So if we stop and think about that, we should be able to figure out what must have happened, right? We've got this evidence, and we can work backwards to the crime scene and say, ah, this, this happened, that happened, and then these reads happened, right? So that's good, that's sequentially consistent. And then we have this case. And we've got, you know, this guy read one and two, the other guy read two and one. And if you just look at these three, you say, okay, that's fine. That's, that's that case. You know, that, that, something like this must have happened. And if you only looked at these three processors, you'd go, ah, this must have happened. But when you look at them all together, you're like, wait a second, something strange happened here. One guy says one and then two, the other guy says two then one. And we've got, you know, eyewitness accounts that, you know, the red car came first and then the blue car crashed into it. And the other guy goes, no, 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 the blue car came first and the red car crashed into it. And you have to piece back, you know, wait a second, somebody's lying here. What's going on? This, this is not a consistent story. So this occurrence down here is not sequentially consistent. So that's what we mean by sequentially consistent. Um, <coughs> the interesting part is, you know, if you want to throw out sequentially consistent, you can, you know, your processor will gladly do this for you. But it's just hard to reason with. Yes? So uh, why are we trying to probe this? In, uh, isn't it that the memory model that the OS is providing already guarantees that right consistency will be uh, applied? The, uh, the processor will gladly, the system will gladly do this for you. And by default, it'll do this for you. Right. You have to use atomics and stuff, which we'll get to, to make this not happen. That's basically the point. Um, this, this, this can happen, this is actually faster because in this model, each thread only worries about itself, right? And, and if you say, uh, that's fine, I don't need my world view to be consistent, I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable with general relativity, you know, what you see and what I see aren't the same thing, that's, that's, that's not a problem. Um, you know, just, just relax a little bit, it's like, well, you know, that's just like your opinion, man. So, you know, which one came first, hey, it doesn't really matter. Um, that's okay in some cases, right? And that's what the processors will give you unless you, you know, and what, in, in this model, the react relax model, you imagine like this, these four probes aren't being put together to figure out what went on, they're just four independent probes. So these are four independent threads, they don't have any, okay. Yeah, right now they're just reading and writing memory. Right? Okay. That's all we're talking about. So then there is no correct way of like, you know, deciding which, what's the intended behavior. Yeah, yeah well, <coughs> Yeah, all I'm trying to point out is, is one thing is what does sequential consistency mean and then we'll see how we can use it and also, you know, that... 
Yeah, what, what does it mean to not have sequential consistency and, and the fact that processors are trying to, you know, their default mode is to have, is relaxed, is to not be consistent. Um, I want to go backwards a little bit. So yeah, so that's so my you know my precise definition of a relaxed model is 16 egotistical or laid-back spots um, that don't care what the others think, but individually they're consistent. You know, they won't see anything odd from their point of view. They just don't talk to each other. So that's not quite precise. Maybe. Um, so that's what we have to work with. <coughs> Now we want to use atomics to have our cake and eat it too, but I'll warn you that you bake the cake, so you're the one who's going to eat it. Um, and now we, you know, we want to do um, use atomics, so we found including topics and we get all this crazy stuff. It's easier to read. Let's just go through one at a time, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that and that's just the, the interface, it doesn't have any of the inline implementation. So basically, the main part of the atomic thing is a, a template called atomic. And there's basically three main um, specializations of it. There's the generic one, there's one for integers, there's one for pointers. And basically, they all. when you start looking at the header file, you see they kind of look like this, where, for one thing, every function in there has two versions, the volatile and the not volatile. And they also all, every single function <coughs> in atomic is no except. Right? So what I'd like to do is stop mentioning the two versions, and you know, because it won't fit on the slide. So, um, and one thing about the volatile, volatile basically has nothing to do with threads. Um, and before C++11, you know, threads weren't really standard part of the language, so people were like, oh, can I use volatiles for that? Because the point of volatiles is, is not for what's going on inside the memory model, it's for what's going on outside. It's the memory model speaking out to the rest of the world and the model coming, you know, getting information back into the world. So if you've got all these 16 spots, you know, writing memory, volatile doesn't help them speak to each other. Volatile helps them speak to the outside world. So it just volatile is not going to be talked about in this, any, in, in this whole talk other than it basically has little or nothing to do with threading. So. I hope people don't think it does, because you go on comp programming threads and you get bashed in the head and talk about volatile. So I'm going to take away the double versions of every function. I'm going to take away the no accept. If the function looks like it's const, it's going to be marked const to get all that kind of stuff right. Um, so, and on top of that, not only all those functions, for every function there, there's a C-like interface that um, takes a pointer to the object instead of an internal function, all these free, free functions. Um, and for those, because it's so C-like, they don't want to have um, uh, default default params. They actually have different words. Here's the, the one param version. Here's the two param version. And I'm just <coughs> not going to talk about the C-like versions anymore because it gets really long in you know, the five param version of some functions. So we can ignore all those and fit, fit stuff on a slide. And this is basically what you have to work with for the generic atomic. Um, Integrals and pointers, I'll show that they have a little more they can do. Um, bool in your generic T's can do this. And by generic T, the whole point is that you can put whatever object of your own in there. There's some restrictions on what your object can do. It can basically do nothing. It has to be a blob of memory that's a trivial copyable and all these constraints. Because um, basically, the, the implementation of Atomic for your struct that has 18 bytes in it is going to be using memcopy and, and memcompare. So, better be prepared for that. Um, the, the base class of Atomic, or the, the, the generic implementation of Atomic, also handles bool without any extra. Actually, I think bool is specialized, but it doesn't have any extra functions beyond the, beyond the base. So what do we have? We have a constructor that you know, does nothing. Uh, we have a constructor that's const, which is great. Um, you'll notice that there's no copy constructors. Um, and it's interesting because you can you can, you know, they have an equal operator that takes the underlying type, and you can return the underlying type. So if this is an atomic int, you can set an int, and you can get an int back, yet I can't set an atomic to an atomic. And you can puzzle why that they might have done that, but I suspect the reason is when you see atomic A equals atomic B, you say, oh, those are atomic, so that's an atomic operation, right? It's like, no, no, 
because reading from one is atomic and writing to the other is atomic, but the whole operation together is not atomic. So it's probably best to not give the impression that they might have been. Right? So that's those, and you can use the equal operator, and you can just you know read and write this way, or you can use functions, explicit functions, store and load. And we haven't talked about memory order yet, but that's what these are for, so you can specify your memory order. If you don't care, you can just go with the default store load, and I guess we have talked about sequential consistent. The point is that is the default. If you use atomics, you get sequential consistency amongst all your atomics for free. Not for free. For free in typing, not for free in uh, programming, in speed. Um, and then we have a bunch of exchange functions that I'll talk about a bit in a bit. And we have this funky function down here called isLock free. So for any type, we can ask, there's some ways to ask at compile time, but maybe it's always lock free. Um, but mostly it's a runtime check to say, you know, are, are ints atomic on this platform? And um, I'm not atomic, lock free on this platform, which means that is there a lock hiding, hiding behind this object or not? Is it just using native processor things to do this without locks? Um, so speaking of is lock free, there is one struct in the standard called atomic flag, and it's as basic as possible, and it's the only thing that's guaranteed to always be lock free. Um, so technically, the C++ 11 has added a constraint onto the system that if you had a system that can't, couldn't be lock free, you can't support C++ 11, I guess, because you must support this one thing. And this thing is so basic that um, it has a default constructor, uh, you can't copy it or anything. You can set it, but you can't set it to any particular value. You can just set it to true, basically, and you can clear it. And when you set it, it'll tell you what the old value was. There's no other way to read it. You can't just ask what the value is. You have to set it and find out what it used to be. And um, the only other thing you can do with it is initialize it to something here. If you don't initialize it to this, they don't even guarantee whether it's zero or one to start. Um, the interesting thing I found when I was reading the standard, or my at least last version of the standard I could find, uh, the constructor is default, but this has to work. There's, you know, you can't, so I find that a little bit interesting. There's no constructor that takes this gram, but somehow this is supposed to work. So I don't know how that works in the standard, but um, maybe that just hasn't been spelled out. Um, no, that's, that's pretty much it for that thing. Um, but it's the, the important part of this is, in theory, this is the only thing you need to build everything else. You can build all your atomics, you can build locks, you can build everything with just this structure. And all you get to do with it is set it to a value and ask what the value is to be. You can't even ask, you can't even say, well, if it's zero, set it to one. You can just say, no, no, I'm setting it to one. What was it? And try to figure out what's going on based on that. Sorry, quick question. Uh, like, is lock free is not a static function here? No. That's unfortunate. Um, they kept, they, is lock free has gone through a lot of discussion. And at one point, when I, I mean, last year even when, at BlueSky, I was talking to Michael Wong and a few people. At one point, is lock free didn't even guarantee that calling it now and calling it in two minutes would return the same result. Which is, you know, completely useless. It's like, oh, it's lock free, okay, I'll use this lock free algorithm. Oh, it's not lock free anymore, oh. Um, so there are, so now there's some, some wording saying, no, 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 if, if, it's, if it returns true, it'll keep returning true, and things like that. But there's, there's also, um, there are some macros to check, you know, for, for the base types, char, and int, and stuff like that. You can, there's macros saying, is it always lock free? Or is it lock free depending on what I'm, you know, because I can compile for x86, all x86, right? It's like, well, maybe that's lock free, maybe it's not. Or I can compile for just this very targeted processor. And in that case, it might say, yes, it's always lock free. I know exactly where you're running this program, so I can tell, tell you at compile time it's lock free. Mm. But most of the time, it's like, once you're running, you can say, okay, this is lock free. The interesting part they had was, one of the arguments was, if I say, is this is this integer lock free? Okay, yeah, that one is, but this integer here isn't aligned in memory, so it's not lock free, although that one is. And I think they finally solved that by saying, okay, if it's an atomic int, it must be aligned. So if one atomic int is lock free, all atomic ints are lock free. Uh, I think that's how it works, but considering how many times they've changed their mind on it, it's not going to be guaranteeing it. 
I hope that's how it works, otherwise it's kind of useless. Um, so that's most of this stuff. It's the lock free stuff. Um, so now if you specialize your atomic with pointers or integrals, and in charge and stuff, they add these functions to add and increment and things like that. And if you are not, this is, you know, this is pointers and integers. If you're an integer only, you get ands and ors and stuff. And you'll notice that operator plus plus, this, this is atomic. You know, this is not the same as read, increment, and then write in three steps. This is a one step. Or if it can't be one step, it'll put a lock in there for you. But this is basically, on most processors, a one step operation. It's a atomic operation. And you notice that they don't actually have a, a plus operator. They only have a plus plus. But they are, they are similar to the uh, good old equivalents where one returns a previous value, the other returns a new value? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you've got you've got both both versions of it. And again, if you want to be specifying your memory order, um, you can you can use these functions to do it for you. Um, so going back to the general atomic object, uh, I think I can now eliminate much of those and focus on these functions. Um, and they've got this thing called memory order, and here's your possible values of memory orders. And basically, we kind of mentioned this one, right? We've got an idea of what sequential consistency means. And we have this one, relax, which means anything goes, basically. So like, I'm just writing that variable, and I don't care what other threads are doing. We're not talking to each other. And, uh, and as it turns out, there's a bunch of options in between those. This is the most relaxed, this is the most uh, strict, and the other ones are in between. And we'll get to see how those work. So um, you'll notice. This is from Boost Content, it's from IBM, it's Michael Wong's slide. Um, I'm blatantly stealing it. Instead of retyping this all, it's like, look, it's Michael's slide. Um, it's okay, you got it. Yeah, <laughs> technically, you know, I, I, I live in Canada, I work for a company in Canada, we pay taxes. Some of that, you know, pennies of that dollar somehow go to Michael being on the standards committee, so I feel like he works for me. <laughs> uh, use his slide. You're my boss. Yeah. <laughs> um, and now that he's here, I'll, I'll describe, I'll probably do this like completely differently than he did. Um, one thing I wanted to do is slightly change the title of it because maybe I'm using it in a different way than he was. And we want to look at what what are these different, you know, we've got the relaxed on one end, we've got sequential consistency on the other, and we've got this acquired release in the middle that we want to figure out what that, what that means. So we've got, we're going to set, one thread's going to set X, it's going to, uh, set Y, the other thread is going to wait around for Y, and it's going to sit there until Y got set, and then it's going to see what X is. And so you can see the obvious idea here is that I'm going to wait until this has happened, right? And by waiting, you, you set up this relationship that we know that this has happened before that because it's all in one thread, and, you know, we, hard to program if things don't go in program order, right? And we have a hard time getting anything done. So if this happens, then this happens because they're in the same thread. This connects to the other thread by waiting. And then from here down, that, that has to happen after this because it's in thread order. And we can see that this guarantees that this happened before that, and therefore, you know, this will definitely happen, right? And what this thing here is, is called synchronizes with. And what we have is a store to this Y, which better be atomic, with either release or with sequential consistency, and then this guy does a load with either acquire or sequential consistency, and if he reads the value that this guy stored, you know, if this was just an if, well, you wouldn't know what order it happened, but this, this, he's waiting to make sure, yes, I have read what you wrote, then we guarantee that these two guys have synchronized each other, and we've got this synchronized with relationship, and, and that builds upon these, this is called happens before, this is happens before, this is a, you know, this is program order happens before, this is synchronized with happens before, and we can then say this happens before that, because we try it all together. Um, the interesting part for me in this is that we don't need sequential consistency, we only need release and acquire, so let's figure out what that means. So right now, these two things, because I did specify what my memory uh, ordering was, they're by default sequential consistent. If I were to change these to release 
And at this point, I'm starting to think maybe I should just wrote the slides myself, but I'm just going to keep augmenting his slide more and more. Um, if I change these to release and change that to acquire, well, that follows the model, right? It's like I've done the release on the store, I've done the acquire on the load, and what, what I get is basically this release says not only is Y going to be set properly, but this says everything that's ever happened in this thread for all time is now going to be committed. It's basically, this is basically the Git model, right? It's like, I do all my local Git changes and I can commit locally, but at some point I have to push up to the, to the you know, to GitHub or something. And then this guy over here, so I, I've done my part, I've pushed it up, I've said, yep, release, this is good, this is a good version of my code. And this guy's not gonna see my code though, obviously, unless he does his half, he has to pull the code back down into his local repository. And then, Everything that happens here on is his future. So we've linked the whole complete past of this thread to the future of that thread. It's kind of, it's kind of called the, the timeline cone model. Yes? Please tell me if I'm getting ahead of things. Uh, but why, if, the, if these are sufficient uh, for store and load specifically, why did they make the default sequential consistency? And maybe Yes. Is it possible with sequential consistency, they're only doing like the right barrier? You're only one slide ahead. Okay, okay. good. Does that accept to be an atomic here? You're, you're half a slide ahead. Okay. <laughs> and by slides, I mean like half the times I'm hitting button, it's all kind of crammed onto one slide. Um, oh, what were you asking? Does the X have to be sequential consistent here? No, because like I said, everything that's happened before this point will get set, right? X doesn't even have to be atomic. This is X is just any memory. You can relax it all you want. All your other variables, and this is the whole point of locks, right? When I when I write, I've got some shared data, and I probably have a slide for I'll just say it twice. If I got some shared data, I just do normal writes. X equals 10, Y equals 20, blah 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 blah. And then the lock, I say, okay, you know, release the lock. It's the lock that that does this part and says, yes, okay, everything you've done that wasn't atomic has now been committed. So we can relax on both sides here. And the important part, which seems obvious in this example, but it's not obvious, it's not, not obvious in the next example. This is the key, right? We've done a release on this side with the store. We see the same variable. We do an acquire. It ties everything together. And, um, and yes. Oh, yeah. So that's basically what I was just saying is that you know this is kind of what a lock does. It releases. It, it does acquire at the start of a lock, and it does release at the end of a lock. Um, one thing I didn't, I hadn't thought when I was writing this up is, interesting thing is, what about stuff that happens down here? Right? You know, so I'm saying everything that's happened to this point will get committed. And then I set Z, and then I set W, and a bunch of other stuff down here. <coughs> Some of those might get caught up in this and committed, because they can just float up. Because from this process, from this point of view, it doesn't really matter you know, I set X, I set Y, I set Y, I set X. It's the same from one pro from one processor's point of view. It's like, who cares what order I set those two things in? Right? It's, it's I know what order I, I know that I set X. I, if I don't do an if on them, then it didn't matter what order these were in. So you, can, you, can, you can often get things that that float up into this and get committed. And the same thing here. Things that happen are supposed to have happened here. The processor, if they're not atomic things can float them down into here and they get caught up. So basically in a lock, you say start a lock and end a lock, things can pour into the locks from outside, but things can't pour out of the lock. So, so that means that in the release fire case, if I have an X store, or Y store, or X store, the second X store can float above. Yeah, it may or may not. Yeah, right. I so I would believe that that's true. Because that would violate your your sequential ordering there. I think that yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm saying in the relaxed model. In a relaxed model, yes, yes. 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 If you didn't say relaxed, but relax, the relaxed, the, the, the next door that's there cannot fall below yeah. the Y. Yeah. This can't fall because this is this is a blocker. Right. This is a one-way blocker, though. It's like everything has happened. Boom, stop. It doesn't block anything from going that way. And that does the opposite. It says release means. Everything that happened before happened before. Before means before. Acquire means after means after. It just doesn't say anything about the other stuff. Because if you think about when you're locking, you know, you say I've got some shared data, I want to lock and, and I want to protect this data. 
you can be doing some other work up here, you know, you're setting X and setting Y, doing some stuff that isn't, it's outside the lock. So obviously you don't really care if it floats in, like it's unimportant stuff, it's not shared. So when it gets to the, you're basically saying, if it's outside the lock, you're saying, when it gets to main memory, I don't really care. So, well, I can, the processor can say, well, I'll put it in main memory, right down here while I'm doing this other main memory stuff. You, you said that was okay. You put it outside of the lock. Um, so that's basically sequential consistency um, is not really needed in this example. We just need a quiet release. And if we were to change these to relaxed, obviously then this, tri this connection that we're trying to do um, won't work anymore. That goes away uh, and we get this assert will fire because now we have no idea. If everything's relaxed. We really don't know what order these things happen in. And basically what can happen is these two can get reordered. So you say, yeah, yeah, I'm gonna wait for Y and then look at X, but X really didn't get, didn't get seen to have happened. Or it can actually, a processor can do speculative execution, right? It's coming along here and says, oh, I'm gonna have to look at X soon. So I'll, I'll start reading X up here because that's more efficient. And so, you know, if you say relax, it's like, I'm gonna just reorder these things to make it more efficient. And because you're just doing a load and another load, it's like, what order, you know, for a single processor, you don't care what order those two reads happen in. And you're basically saying, I don't care what order they happen in. If you're, only, if you're the only processor in the world, you'd be like, no one else is writing these, so why, why do I care what order they get ready? In? I've got no other things going on in between, so it's fine to reload them. Um, so someone asked, I was going to say an interesting point there is you still want to determine even if you want relaxed because otherwise you have the potential problem of never seeing the change. Yeah, there's some real subtleties with that because the standard says for relaxed that you know it'll eventually get written in a timely manner. Right. <laughs> then you get weird things like okay, what if I loop? You know, I'll just like this. You know, I'll loop on this variable. If this was relaxed, will I ever see it? It's like yeah, you'll see it. I think technically if it's not atomic, you can just say, no, no. I'm never going to read that. Right? Yeah, yeah. It can, if it's not atomic, it can just be set in a register. Yeah, and it'll never, you know. And that's why people start use, trying to use the file to guarantee these things. It's, it's not quite huge. Um, so, the, I'm going to change the title of this one again. Um, the point of this one, let's see what's going on here. One thread sets X. This guy waits to make sure X was set. And then he's going to look at y, and this guy's going to do the opposite. It's going to set y, and this thread, this y is going to, thread's going to wait to make sure he sees y, and then he's going to look at x. And now the question is, what what could possibly be, what could possibly happen here? And if we see y is zero in this guy, in this case, then well, I guess if y is zero, this must have happened first, and this hasn't happened yet. Like that's the, you know, that's basically what this guy would surmise from the whole situation, right? So I know X happened. Y is still zero. I guess that hasn't happened yet. So all this stuff happened before all of that stuff, right? So it's like that. You can imagine that's what, that's what must have happened. This guy, if he sees the same thing, if he sees X first instead, he can go, oh, I guess that it happened in the other order. So now, if you see both of these things, the, each thread sees this world view, you'd be like, Wait a second, that's not consistent. One guy's saying X happened first, the other, and Y second, the other guy's saying, no, no, Y was first and X was second. That's, that's not sequential consistency. So, the question is, um, you know, so for sequential consistency, I can say, this can't happen. They both can't be zero. Therefore, I can, you know, mathematically prove that this assert is fine. Z will get set, it will never be zero. So now the question is, let's try to use acquire release, right? You know, why, why, why do we need this? Why can't we just use that? And now the question is, look around here and say, okay, acquire release, I need a store where I'm gonna do the release, and I need a load on the same variable, and it's gonna have to see that store, and then I can look, uh, you know, align these two world views together. And so it's like, you know, here's a store, and you know where's the where's the load? You know there's a load and here's a load. So this guy can is waiting. This guy can say, yep, definitely with acquire release, I can say that this happens before that. 
this guy is only an if statement. I don't know if I'm going to see the value. You know, the third part of uh, synchronized with is if I see the guy's value, then I'm synchronized. Here, there's no guarantee that I saw the value. This guy I guarantee because I'm going to wait until I see it. This is like, well, I might see the guy's value or I might not. So this isn't necessarily synchronized with that. Similarly, you look over on this side, you say, okay, these two guys are synchronized together because he will definitely see his value. But this guy may or may not see his value. So you can try to line up any of these, you know, it's called pairwise alignment, pairwise synchronization. It's like, okay, where can I line these guys up so that I only need to use acquire release to guarantee this? And sit here all day trying to draw arrows, you can't do it. This requires sequential consistency to have this happen. And that, in an essence, this, this is the point of sequential consistency is you want to be able to reason about your program so that you can say, yeah, yeah, you know, this can't, these can't both be zero. I can conclude that one of them was true. You know, that's how we reason about things. If you throw out sequential consistency, suddenly it's really hard to reason about everything. So it's really nice of the standard to put sequential consistency into the atomics. And they basically said, let's make that the default because it's the only one we can reason about. It's really hard to, you know, relativity is hard. Newtonian mechanics is relatively easy. Relativity is um, yeah, there's a huge cost to that. And the other, not only the performance cost, my question is, why do you want to let people write code like this? Like, I'm just going to pull on this value forever until it changes. Like, yeah, maybe you should just use a lock. Wouldn't that be nicer? You know, you, you won't, this is burning the CPU waiting for this to change instead of saying, you know, tell the scheduler to, to let me sleep until it happens. Right? So, so we've enabled you to reason about bad code better. <laughs> so, obviously, it's important in some places, but my, the whole, every time I talk about lock free stuff, my whole point is you should be doing this. Like, you should just use locks. It's a lot easier. And, and you know, why, why write code like this? But, yeah, you can. Yes. I was just going to say, you know, you talked about burning CPU and stuff, and well, battery-powered devices are really big this yeah. decade. Yeah, exactly. Carry one in your pocket. Yeah. You know? So this is much worse than it used to be. Yes. Well, I have two things. First, I would say that some people are happy to burn the CPU when you can make a million dollars when you do that. <laughs> <laughs> so but that's a side point. Yeah. The second thing is, so you were saying that the that happens before from like the, the bottom Y load, for instance to the top Y load in the Y store, because because it's not doing a while on the bottom one, yeah. there is, if, if it's just a release on the top one, there's no happens before. Yeah. So, but, but that implies that if you use sequential consistency, there is a happens before. Like, how does that, how does that work? Yeah, and that's, that's like, even my definition of happens before is, is not what's written in the standard. The standard's way more complicated than how they have to say this. And basically all they say is, there must have been a happens before somewhere because this couldn't have happened. <laughs> like, it's, it's like, okay. you know, proof by contradiction. Well, you, they could have both been zero, so, you know. And then, and then all they do is leave it up to the guy implementing atomics to say, make sure that doesn't happen. You know, whatever you have to do for your processor. For, you know, basically for uh, x86, there's not a lot you have to do. It's almost sequential consistent by default. There's just a few things when you're storing variables to, to basically you just flush you just say your, your write buffer that I had in that one slide. You just make sure you flush things and, and do some locking across. I mean, that's, this is why it's slow, is you have to talk to all the other processors and say, hey, are we good with this? Is this are we consistent with what's going on? I've set, I've set x here. If I set x here, tell everyone that I set x, instead of just saying, oh, yeah, you know, you'll see it eventually. Right? The best description of the stuff that I've seen is uh, there's about a 10 page comment in the Linux kernel uh, uh, that breaks down a very nice definition of memory barriers and what the different partial order guarantees are for different kinds of memory barriers. And there's a one to one mapping between memory barriers and uh, right. memory models. Right. So. The, uh, you know, when you get down to the processor level, like the, the you know, I listed like six memory ordinaries. You know, at the processor level, there's, there's, there's tens more you can play with. Them. Depending on whether your memory is an I.O. memory or this, or, or executable memory or this kind of thing. Depending on what the system has, you could have all kinds of, you know, oh, I just want to synchronize the instruction cache, not the data cache, or, you know. And the, the reason why uh, Hans Bohm wrote a paper a while ago on you can't do proper threading in a 
library, and just the library, which is why we have a memory model in C++, is because compilers are allowed to reorder things, which, which effectively violates any, any ordering that you have. Trying to guarantee the library. And it's to be a software contract and a hardware contract. Yeah. Yes. Right. You get really weird things where, you know, the, I, I, mean, I don't know the example, but you have a for loop where, you know, go through 100 items, and on each item in your vector or whatever you check, oh, if the item has some flag set, I'm going to set a, I'm going to grab a lock, do some stuff, or, or you know, I'm just going to run through them all and see if I need to grab the lock, kind of thing. Well, the, 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 C, the compiler used to be able to pull, you just say, you know what, I'm not going to check this if every time, I'm just going to do it locally, and then at the end I'll just check something and whether I really do it. And it's like, wait a second, you can't do that anymore because you know, locally isn't the same as it used to be. And there's certain optimizations the compiler used to do that it's no longer allowed to do. Um, so that's, we went from relaxed to sequential consistency. We've got a little idea what acquire and release are like. Um, this one is just saying if I'm doing some of these operations that, I'll talk about these in a second, but basically they do reads and writes at the same time. You can say I need both on the read I need Acquired on the right, I need release. Uh, I'm going to avoid this one for now. I should avoid it for always, probably. Um, so that's, I think we've seen enough of load and store. And let's look at some of these last ones here. So, exchange is pretty darn simple. You have some kind of your own custom lock thing, and you say, you know, set it to true because I, I want exclusive access to this data. So. You just set it to true. I don't care what it, you know, I'm not going to look at first what it was. I'm just going to set it true and then see what it was. This returns the old value and say, well, it should be a not there. If it comes back as zero, you can say, oh, I set it to one and I was the first guy to set it to one. Therefore, I'm the only one here. I can take ex exclusive uh, use of the data and then I can say I'm done with it and set it to false. Right? Um, the weird part is that if it if you come in and you set it to true and it returns true, it's like no no someone else was already here. You just reset it to true again, but you know, no no big deal. Um, and then you'll you'll have to figure out okay what do I do if I can't get you know, this is poor man's lock. You uh, what you can talk to the scheduler now or you're gonna sleep. What are you gonna do if you can't get the lock? Um, and this is where the atomic flag is actually useful because all you can do with the atomic flag is test and set, and that should be a not in there again, and clear. So that's that's exactly what atomic flag was meant to do. Um, and atomic flag is guaranteed to be uh, lock free, so it's good. Um, so that's exchange. And Mark, then, if, do you know why they standardized atomic flag and said this one has to be lock free? Other physically systems which can only support that one is lock free, and they can't do yeah atomic yeah. again. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Okay. Can you imagine like can those guys just go out of business? <laughs> <laughs> can you Most imagine implementing are. implementing everything with just that one? You've got an atomic <laughs> flag. Go implement all of you know posit or you know, standard threads or something. Uh, I'm 68. Okay. We're kind of we're kind of processor. We're the only way to achieve an atomic flag is by turning it over. Yeah. Yeah. Some of them don't even have an instruction for it. Right? Okay. Some blackberries, little blackberries. Um, so, if we want, we can throw in uh, memory orders, and and this is the case where I say this is all you need is an acquire. If you're going to acquire the data, and then you're going to release the data, and you know, there's a use of acquire and release. It's pretty pretty standard. That's basically what a lock does. Right? Exactly that. Um, so that's exchange. Let's take a look at the compare exchange. Um, Four versions of it, um, but basically, compare exchange. Uh, the way you're expected to use that is you look at. We've got this count here, and we look at it and say, "What was the count?" We're going to try to make a new count. Probably just add one to it. This is the new value that we want to use. And then what this does is say, "Okay, I've been I've been spending you know a century trying to trying to calculate this new value. The whole universe may have changed between now and then. Um, so." When I go and set the value, only set it if it still, you know, it was 10, I want to set it to 11. If it's still 10 now, set it to 11. 
11. If it's not 10 anymore because someone else came in, just don't you know return false. So and I'll I'll try again. Right? Now, interesting thing, they they went through a lot of iterations of how this should all work because there's people have been writing these loops a lot for years and years, and they all do it slightly differently. But you know, it fails and says, no, no, was someone has changed this on you, it's now called, it's not 10 anymore, kind of, you know, someone changed it behind your back. So come up and try again. So, you know, by the looks of it, you got 10, you're still going to calculate 11 again, right? No, because what this does, if it fails, it updates the value for you. Because it knows you're probably going to come around and just read it again and try to calculate a new value, right? So, you know, I read, hey, it's 10, I want it to be 11. Whoa, it's 15 now? Okay, well, uh, let's make it 16. Oh, 24. Oh, 25? And then, yeah, yeah, okay, good. You know, you finally get your chance to get in there. Um, and basically, what does compare exchange do? It checks what the value, if the value is what it, what it used to be, set it, otherwise, update the was thing so that you can try again. Um, and it does that atomically, that's the magic. Hopefully, it's a single instruction on your processor that does that all at once. Um, <coughs> right. Here's an interesting case. Instead of saying, is count the same as what it was when I read it, can I just say, has anyone touched it? Those look very much the same, right? You're trying to, the same idea of, is it still 10? But these are subtly different. This is, has anyone touched the variable? Has anyone re wrote the variable? They might have written 10. They might have written the same value, but they still wrote to it. And the difference here is that some processors like to do things this way. It's called link load store conditional. And some processors like to do it that way. Basically, this is like Intel x86. This is power of PC and very variations on that. So what they basically do, it's back here when you do the load, it does a link load It says, I'm going to load this variable, and I'm going to set a flag to say, keep an eye on that variable. Later, when you go to set it, it goes, hey, did anyone touch that? Even if they set it to the same value, it's like, hey, did anyone touch that? And you think, what's the difference? Does it make any difference which way it goes? Turns out it does make a difference, and we'll see a few ways it does make a difference. Um, one of the things that makes a difference is why we have an exchange weak and an exchange strong. Exchange strong will... And so what happens in this one, sometimes you'll get it where the values were the same, but it returns false anyhow, right? It just says, someone changed it, it actually changed it to the same value, but someone changed it, so I'm returning false. Um, and you could take that and just go, well, can't you just tell that it was the same value and, and you know, handle this and try it again for me? But why, why should the processor try to, try to do this again for you when you're probably just going to do this anyhow? You're probably going to be working in a loop. So if you're working in a loop, you want to use weak. If you're not working in a loop, you can use strong to say, just make sure for me, right? Make it act this way, even if it really acts that way. And it's a bit, it's kind of a subtle thing, but basically strong could be, depending on your processor, strong can be, can have a loop inside of it and can be a little, little uh, more expensive than this one. So they split it out because the whole point of atomics at all is to be efficient. So any bit of efficiency that I'm sure you can do it. Yes? Uh, so in this sequence, uh, you, you acquired uh, an atomic clock. And why, if your thread is well scheduled, why holding this atomic clock? Can you, in this sequence, does this guarantee that your, your thread is keeping the processor? No, exactly not. No. Right, that's, so that's it might wait for a long time. Yeah, and, and I don't have the definition of lock free here, but that's the point of lock free. The point is, um, so if this is a classic, if we just did this in a lock, right? You say, you know what? I just want to lock this thing, and then I'm going to increment it. Now I know no one's going to touch it, and then I'm going to unlock it, right? So I could do a lock, and then everyone else is going to have to wait for me. And then the scheduler inside the lock, the scheduler could just say, uh, take a break, right? And I could get unscheduled and sit there for two weeks, and everybody else who wants this count is also going to be sitting there waiting, right? So that's, what's the difference? It's not lock free. I forgot what the, what the term is. There's wait free as well. Yeah. I can't even remember the term yeah, for the normal non lock free case. Um, 
So what happens in a lock-free case is you say, I'm going to read this. Other people might be reading it at the same time. Um, and then I will try to set it. If I got preempted and someone else came in and changed it on me, he wasn't waiting for me. I didn't take exclusive access. The other guy got to do something, right? We're both trying to do the same thing, most likely two threads doing the same code. Um, if one of us gets unscheduled, the other guy's not waiting. The other guy makes progress. So you can have 10 threads all trying to you know, increment count. If one of those threads gets unscheduled, the other threads are like, fine, you don't get to do anything, but I'm still going. Right? In a lock case, the guy with the lock stops, everybody stops. So lock free is one, at least one of the threads gets to keep going. He only stops if someone else got in the way. I mean, the scheduler could stop everybody. You know, like all 10 of your threads could be stopped. But not, nothing you can do about that. As long as one of your threads is scheduled, you will make progress. That's, that's the definition of lock free. <coughs> um, let's see what the, that's the difference between weak and strong is related to how that compares which, to which one's which, again. Strong is this model. It says, if it is the same value, go ahead and set it. So, which is exactly what you want here. But it's not what you want because I'm looping, but it's it's the idea that you want is is um, all I want to do is increment the value. So, if it's still 10, set it to 11. But I have to write this loop anyhow, so don't bother doing the loop inside of the strong because. The chance of this hap the chance of this it's called uh, spurious failure. The chance of the spurious failure is pretty small, so you know I, I've already got a loop. Don't bother with the other one. Um, and of course, so that's that. And um, the second version. Now that we understand weak and strong, we have to understand what these two. You can have the one memory order version or the two memory order version. And let's say I decide that I want acquire, release, and relax to pass in these two memory orders. What the heck am I talking about? The thing is, if this happens, I want this memory ordering. If that happens, I want that memory order. So it's the it's the success memory order and the failure memory order. One of these two things is going to happen inside the exchange, and I can be very precise and say, this is how I want it to work, and this is how I want that to work. And I'm going to claim off the top of my head that for incrementing a count, you know, this count is probably doing something important like it's part of a shared pointer or something like that. Um, it's probably somehow guarding other data. So you probably want a, uh, acquire because I'm going to increment the shared pointer and then read the data. Or I'm done with the shared pointer and I'm going to release the data. So I say if, you know, maybe this subtraction or addition, whatever you're doing, if you're changing a counter, you probably want a part of release on success. But if on failure, it's like, eh, don't bother doing any memory ordering because I'm just going to loop around and try again. So as long as I'm in here, even this can be relaxed because it's like, just give me any old value. I don't care. Eventually, I'll, I'll figure out. I will, I will eventually get the right value. Um, and it's only when I exit the loop that I really care what the memory ordering is. If you're doing crazy lock-free programming of data structures and stuff, you know, you might, for every particular case, you might have different uses for, for those, those memory words. Um, and you can do all this, or you could use an atomic int and just do count plus plus, or do a fetch add if you really care about the memory ordering. And that's a lot easier than writing your own, your own uh, CAS loop. We call it CAS loop because compare exchange used to be called CAS a lot, it used to be called compare and set lot. Yeah. Um, so I'll uh, continue to call. To me, this is a casual. The, the usual version you, you would want to do the compare exchange is like saying um, weak footer, where you want to lock it and get, get a shared footer. It's called lock. Um, essentially, internally, what it needs to do is increment the ref count if it's not already zero. Yeah. Um, in which case, a straight up plus plus and atomic is not the right thing to do. There you want to say, can I add one to it? But wait, if it's zero, I don't want to do anything. Right so that's when you need that. Yeah, it's exactly, anytime you want to do more than just increment, right? Maybe maybe this counter is 
uh, you know, an index into a, a fixed length array, and I don't want to walk off the end. If I get to the end of the array, I want to come back to the beginning, like, like a buffer, circle the buffer or something. Then it's like, well, I need to do custom, you know, operation in the middle here. So, you know, you, the only thing that are built in is add and, and increment, not not your you know, mod 17 or something like that. Um. Uh, so I, I, I just want to make a comment about the log three and the wait three, wait three stuff. The log three structures that do it in a loop like that, because of the, uh, the timing thing where the other thread can get in and, and, and make changes to it, eventually can lead to starvation by one of the, by one of the thread. And this is why they, they, they created this wait free property. And the wait free property essentially defeats this, uh, hopefully defeats this starvation problem. Yeah. Um, yeah, like right in here. Yeah. Um, because the other would, threat might never succeed, and you just don't know it. You the, won't, you the way might I never described know. this in the past was, um, you know, your your count. You know, you, you want you know everyone gets a, everyone gets to vote. And you want your vote to count, right? So you you're voting for Obama, and you know everyone's voting for Obama. So every time you try to get your vote in there, it's like, oh, someone else got there before me. So, oh, I'll try again. Oh, someone else got there before me. It's like. Oh man, I can't help it, but but you know, eventually I'll, I'm going to be waiting here forever. I'm going to be the last one to vote for Obama, you know. And if you're voting for McCain, then it's like, oh yeah, no problem, go ahead. Comes <laughs> <laughs> the last one. Sure. Yeah, you can you can start in, in this loop. Um, so that's we're down to we just explain kind of compare exchange. And let's let's use compare exchange in another way, not with integers, but with star star keys. Um, and since the talk on threading, the tutorial on threading, used a, a did a stack. I'm going to use a lock free stack. And our stack kind of looks like this. It's going to be a node based stack. And uh, let's just fill in these functions, right? So what does push do? So we create a new node. Pretty obvious. We um, we get an extra pointer to the head there. That, you know what the head, the old, what, what's going to be the old head. We hook up the new node. You know it's kind of ready to get into the list. But if you come from the outside and read the, the list, you only see this, right? Because you, you come here and you read across. But this guy's ready to take over for for head. For, yeah. Um, and that's the next thing we do. We say, okay, stop pointing here, add this guy to the thing, and we now added this node to the head of the list, right? Awesome, great. Um, but of course, this is completely broken. You can use atomics and sequential consistency and whatever you want, it's still broken. <coughs> it's broken because between reading what the head was here and then setting the head there, the whole world could have changed, right? This is this is an eternity happening between here. We, we discovered new planets. We, we found life on new civilizations. Blah blah blah. Where we go? Where the man's gone before? Um, and then you go to set this new head, and it's like, hey, it's changed. So obviously, what do we need to do? We need to do. Let's go steal our code that was doing the increment because it's the same problem. And let's adapt that code for this situation. We do all our stuff. We set up our node to point to where it needs to point to get it all ready, and we say, hey, if head is still this, here's my here's my old head variable, if it's still equal to what head, you know, if head hasn't changed, it's still pointing to that, then swap it to that, right? All, all this green is atomic, right? Check if it's still what it used to be, and if so, set it up. And if it, if it fails, come back up again. Old head got, um, got re-read again here. We got a new one, we set it up, you know, we keep setting this up, there might be more and more nodes getting put in, we keep trying to get ours set up, and eventually we succeed, and we hook this up, right? So yay, we push to a lock free stack. And at no time, because there can be other threads reading the stack at the same time, no one will ever, um, either they will see this, or they'll have already been beyond it. That's, I mean, the whole sense of lock free is, other people can be reading stuff while, while you're adding to it, and it's like, obviously, that's okay, right? It's like. If I've got two threads, and one's going to add to a, 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 a stack, and the other one's going to read, you know, or, or a list, one's going to add to the list, the other one's going to read from the list. Even if you put blocks around the list, you're still saying, 
well, one's going to read first or one's going to add first. You know, I don't, you know, there are two threads. I'll say I don't care what order that happens in. I want it to be consistent, so I put a lock around it, but it could happen in either order. With lock free, you still got the same property. Either the guy got it here before you and is reading this, or it comes in after you and sees that you, you were added. So it's the same property of it sees you added or it doesn't see you added. Um, but the nice part is he never crashes because you were half added or something like that. You were added atomically as a half. Um, and then you can try to reason with yourself what should the semantics of uh, the memory ordering be here. And I'm going to claim that this can be relaxed because you just want to look at head and it's when you get out of here that you really care. And I'm going to claim this is most likely going to be released because you're adding new data and you're going to publish this new data, right? You, you created a new node. At this point, you're the only person this node is local to you. No one else knows about it. And the whole point is that you want to publish that node into this shared list. When you publish data, you want to do a release. When you go to get the published data and you subscribe to data, you want to do the required acquire. Uh, quickly remind us, release is which time cone? <laughs> that pointing down or pointing up? Down. Down, OK. Release is uh, commit to give. Yeah. All right. I'm done. I've released my my work. It's, it's the it's it's this side of the time cone. Everything that's happened has happened. Acquire is everything that's going. Everything in the future is in the future. It hasn't happened yet. <coughs> Acquire is looking ahead and this is looking backwards. So now let's do pop. Same idea. Let's you know get our old head set up. Let's uh, let's look. We're, we're going to pop this one out of there, so we're going to have to hook up head to there, right? So let's step over there and do that. And already we have a bug because you know you just walked off the end of. You don't know if there's nodes there or not, so you better check for null. And you know maybe throw or something like that. The stats empty. Um, and you think that's happy, but really you know it's still broken because <laughs> check check if head's null. Oh, it's not null. And then here, oh, it is null because between here and there, the whole world might have changed. So. Checking for null, and then you know you can't guarantee any between any two instructions anything could have happened right? because we have, don't have a lock around this. And um, now the thing you really have to look at here is my hand, and you'll see it wave. Because <laughs> um, I'm not even going to explain how to solve that little problem. So that's not the problem I want to I want to focus on. But let's imagine that we could solve. And we can solve this by having your own um, memory manager. You know just. Yeah, you're just writing a, a, a simplest, the simplest lock free structure is basically a stack. And all you need to do is write your own memory manager first, right? And then, then, you can, <laughs> and then you're in charge of the memory, whether it actually goes away or not. Um, so let's, uh, we've got the situation, and we're going to do the same thing. Let's put this in a loop, and we'll say, you know, we point that there. Um, So we're wanting to get rid of this node, and we've done that by taking the head to not point to there anymore. Instead, it points to here. And we do a compare exchange to make sure as long as head hasn't changed, we can, we can swap that out and go to the next one. Okay? Does that make sense, hopefully? And I'm going to claim some memory thing. But I'm also going to claim that even if I put sequential consistency here, this is, in fact, broken. It looks the same as the push, but it's broken. How is this broken? So let's go back and imagine that we're this stage in our thing. We've got our stuff set up, and we're about to get rid of this node. And then let's say the world changes, right? Because we take a break here, and someone else comes by, gets rid of these nodes, adds some new nodes, and now the thing looks like this in reality. We still have our old head pointing here. We've got our new head pointing there. But the whole stack has, has moved on. Well, you know what? That's great. We check whether old head and new head are the same thing, right? So we'll say, hey, wait a second. I'm thinking head should be this, but now it's really that. The CAS fails. Good, good, right? So I was like, hey, you changed the whole world on me behind my back. Aha, I will go back up. I will reset my pointers, set everything up again, and I will try again. OK, good. So you know that, that, that's good. That's exactly what you wanted. But now let's go back, exact same thing, and let's say something slightly different happens, right? I'm ready to go, I'm ready to remove this node. And let's say someone else comes by while I'm paused, 
and removes that node for me. Okay, fine, resets things up. And then let's say someone else comes by and puts that node back in for me. And by that node, I mean a different node, but the same memory location, because the memory manager that you're using decided to recycle your memory, because, you know, otherwise you run out. So, you know, this, um, you know, in the push code where it did that new and created a new node, it decided to give you back the same node that we were using five minutes ago. So now we do our CAS, and it goes, hey, excellent. The head hasn't changed. It's exactly what it used to be. So I'll just swap that out and we'll point over to this thing that was actually, wait a second, that was deleted a long time ago. And I've now pointed to here and I've lost all the real nodes and pointed ahead to a deleted node because what's happened is called ADA. This compare exchange said, if it's A, you know, I, it used to be A, if it's still A, do something. Well, wait a second, it changed to be in between, right? And in this case, that's really, you know, in a counter, you don't care. The counter's 10, it went to 11, 12, 13, came back to 10. Oh, great, great, I just want to set it to 11. I don't care what it was in between. With these pointers, you really care. This is a huge problem. Head was A, it became B, it went back to A through recycling, and nothing, you know, the basic assumption is that you're saying if head hasn't changed, the whole list hasn't changed, and that's that's the wrong assumption. Right? <laughs> and now we go back to that. What's the difference between this and this? In this case, even if you saw A and then you see A again, it will tell you. Wait a second. Behind your back, it was B for a while, and then it went back to A. Is that important to you? And you're like, yeah, that's important in this case. Um, so that's great, eh? This is a great... Um, and that's, like I said, it's called link load store conditional. That's a really great feature in some processors. And the standard said, yeah, we're not going to expose that. You actually can't get that feature out of the language. Um, instead, you have to solve ADA problems a different way. One way is to you know, check what processor you're on and, and use this if it's available. But the whole point of the standard was to not have to do processor specific stuff. Um, so the reason I showed this is because I'm not going to show you how to solve this problem. I'm going to say, this is a good reason why you're, you shouldn't be writing this code. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to get this code right. You know, it's like, this, you, you, everything you learn about this stuff, it's like, oh yeah, that should just work. It's like, nope, doesn't work. Yes, there's one way to solve this in practice to have like a counter of updates that you increment every time you modify the thing. Yeah. The, the, one of the main ways to solve it is. Wrong. Really? Oh. When the counter rotates, yeah. Well, every every two handle that sixty-four bits. Yeah. Easier. Every every four billion times, you know, every four billion multiplied by four billion, because it has to align with what's it's, it's still not zero. Yeah. And you know, there's one thing about that whole. I, I know some people who won't allow that, right? So first of all, let's back up. What he's saying is, your A, which you know, we're just a head pointer, and then it's a head pointer again. What you can do is split this instead of using like say you've got a thirty-two bit pointer. You can say, let's use a 64-bit value. Half of it's the pointer. The other half is a count. Uh, every time the head changes, I just increment. So this would be A, and this is now A prime. This is pointer and count 17. This is the same pointer, but count 18. Right? So now you, this will fail. You say, hey, the pointer part looks the same. But I notice your, you know, your counter's up. You're reusing the same pointer. I'm going to fail on you. And that works great if you have atomic, you know, if you're using 32-bit pointers and you have 64-bit atomic, or you're using 64-bit pointers and you have 128-bit or maybe 96-bit atomics or whatever. Well, the code will still compile it, won't be a lot of free. Well, yeah, the, yeah, but, I mean, you're doing all this work, if, if, exactly. if your code's not lock free yeah, maybe you should just put a lock in there yourself, because right. now you've got, uh, you're probably hitting the lock two or three or four times instead of once. Um, the, so I know some people who, that have four billion times, that they don't like that idea. And, and one of the ways I say that is like, four billion, that's a huge number. Wait a second, my processor runs at least four gigahertz. I get to four billion every second. <laughs> if it's doing nothing else, I mean, your system puts you doing other stuff, but four billion in one second, right? So I, I, can, I can roll over that integer all day long. Right? So that's, it's, it's, there's lots of ways to solve this problem. Um, and you have to decide you know, which one works for you. Or you decide to not, I mean, since this is boost, um, the other answer is to use the boost lock-free library that's on its way in.
Um, I think I've just got a few minutes left. Um, I haven't quite stressed it enough as I usually do, but the whole point of my talks are, I, I sometimes call it fear, certainty, and doubt. And <laughs> the certainty part is that you should be afraid and you should be doubtful about doing this kind of stuff. And so just to put, push home the, the fear in, in using the comics, um, we've got some more scary things. Don't blame me for making the number 42 scary. This comes straight out of the standard as one of their examples. We have thread one that is basically going to read from Y into a register and then store it to X, right? So it's just copying Y into X. If you register, we've got thread two that's going to load X and then store 42 into Y, okay? And then we're going to wonder, is it possible that this got one uh, 42 and this got 42. And you can pause here to think about that. How is that possible? Because first it loaded it, and then it set 42. Because So this side, I can see this side, side seeing 42, right? This store happens first, then this guy reads it, and he will, you know, these kind of these kind of link up, right? I stored 42, and then I read it over here, so that's why I got 42 here. How did I get 42 on this side? Well. I stored 42 here after reading it, and then I read 42 over here. So it's kind of like a figure eight here. And guess what? If these aren't, uh, you know, I've done relaxed here. So that's fine. This is valid. You can both, you, you can't assert because it won't always happen, but you can get both R1 and R2 to be 42. So if that doesn't bother you, feel free to write atomic, uh, a lot of free code because you run into these situations all the time. A lot of people, that bothers them. That's why they say, let's use sequential consistency where I can guarantee things like that don't happen. Um, I skipped over memory order consume. Uh, what did I have like half of? Ignore the empty boxes. Um, <coughs> memory order consume is kind of the craziest one, and that's why I kind of tend to avoid it, but it's a great one to to scare people away. All I want to do, you know, okay, I'm going to check if there's a null, and then I'm going to read it, right? And this guy maybe is like, sets foo to 42, and then he publishes, you know, p is the, the shared pointer or the, you know, the global value that I'm going to publish this value by saying p now points to this guy. So the question is, what happens here? There's two read instructions here. First, we have to read the pointer, and then read what the pointer points to, right? So we first have to read p, and then find out that it's pointing to foo, and read the value of foo. That's two reads. Can those reads go out of order? Can I read star p before reading p? It turns out you can <laughs> on some processors. <coughs> you blame Michael, the processor he works on, the, the, the IBM processors do this. And, and usually I just leave that up in the air, is that how that can that happen, right? So, how can you read where it points to before knowing where it points to? But here's an example. Um, let's say this was the line of code before here. And it just happened to read some bar variable that was over here in memory. And then the next thing it reads, you know, p and reads star p and then goes and reads foo. Uh -huh. What the processor might decide to do is like, when I was reading bar, I just picked up foo along the way, right? Because they were on the same cache line or whatever, right? And then when I go to read P, I go, oh, it's over there? Hey, I, already, I just read that a second ago. Why, why would I need to re read it again? I'm the only processor here, right? It couldn't have changed. That's, every processor thinks they're the only processor around. So what in effect happens is I read the value of foo, star P, and then I read P. I read them out of order. So if you're comfortable with things like that, go use. So memory order consume is when you say, I don't need full, I don't need, in this situation, I don't need sequential consistency, I don't need acquire release, I just need consume, because consume is like the weakest of the ordering. On, you know, the vast majority of processors, consume does nothing because they don't do crazy things like this. Only some of the, the risk machines and stuff do these kind of crazy things. The deck alpha was one of the first ones that did. Everything was so relaxed, it was just like, oh yeah, 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 I just, you know. Whatever, I don't care what the other processors are up to. I, I, I think this is fine. And, and if we order something like that. Um, so, you know, trying to assert that we actually read the value 42 there, 
um, I guess maybe this we assume that P was null before here. It says, hey, if it's not null, then I can guarantee I wrote 42, and because of this, you can't guarantee it. Uh, about consuming, I'm having trouble understanding how it's weaker than, I guess, acquire is the next step up. Um, well, it's weaker in the fact that the vast majority of your processors never do this. So most processors, consume does nothing. Right, right, right. But I think about really weak architectures like ARM or whatever. Um, How is it weaker than, sorry, I want ARM and this. Uh, this ignoring the processor, what yeah. guarantees does memory in order require provide that consume does not provide? That's why anybody. I think consume only deals with dependency. Yeah, no, I don't think consume puts the whole, you know, your whole. So if I had, um, I, I guess it would be like a key load with memory order consume, yeah. and then it would be wrap it, and memory order consume says, don't reorder anything that affects P or anything that P yeah. points to. It's very specific. Yeah. Like pointers. What could happen here is you could end up leaving P and not get 42 whatever old value was there. So yeah, get the I, updated version. I, I understand that, but I'm, I'm wondering oh, yeah. if I say P load with memory order consume, that well, only it, affects reordering that yeah. P and things that P points to and anything else. So yeah. on the right there, if you had bar equals 12, if we go right beside foo, you would not be guaranteed that bar so would bar equal one. 12. It, it doesn't take your whole, it doesn't take your whole history and, and commit your whole history, it just commits well, uh, P. Now, the question I don't know. One of the reasons I'm confused is because you have written the atomic version. Right. Would P Sorry. have been release on the right hand side when you write to P? Or is that like yes. max? Or <coughs> no, it's, it's a release. Okay, so release would be paired with consume in this case. Yeah. Um, the, yes. the, the question I'm not even sure about is consume will say, I've got P right. I'm not sure if it's, it's an old value of food. Like it, it'll, Give you the right pointer, but will it give you the? the I think it gives you the right value, yeah. but then nothing else. So it's basically, there is a sort of dependency change from consume load. When we do a load consume, yeah. and the compiler can show the dependency change from that load to whatever other load you're doing, then consume will guarantee that that you have post ordering. When there is no dependency change to whatever other load you're doing, then how does that identify these chains? Uh, I think it's basically everything that involves the, the value with your load of proteins. Yeah, it, it's oh, in the standard, you have a whole list. P, or if you offset P, or if you use P, <coughs> if P is an integer and you use it as an array offset, oh, you actually okay. get. Yeah. The and there's actually, a, there's actually a function in the standard called kill dependency. I've seen that, and I didn't know what it was. It says, you know, I, I see these are linked, but you know, no, in this case, I don't care about the link. Form. Basically, the point of consume is it's hard to understand, and that's probably why we should back away. Well, I'm only asking <laughs> because I didn't maintain the topic, so if anybody yeah. should know. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the other scary things is a thing called false sharing. And let's say I have a uh, struct that has an X and a pre, and they're both atomic, and I've got some thread over here that's doing atomic stuff on next, and another thread that's doing atomic stuff on pre. Those are two different atomic variables, so you know there should be no no problems between these. They should be completely independent. But what often happens is you put these side by side in memory, they end up on like the same cache line or whatever, and it turns out in a lot of cases these are basically one giant atomic variable in a sense. If you mess with this one, this compare exchange can fail, right? And that's called false sharing because looking at your code, all you have to do is put you know, a few more memory variables in between these and suddenly your code behaves differently. Because you don't realize that these two things are sharing their their state in some way because underneath they're too close in memory. So you see a lot of guys who do lock free stuff purposely put padding in between their atomic variables. Takes up more space, but you get some speed up. Because the false sharing can really take a hit when every every atomic operation is like, okay, great, it's it's faster than waiting on a lock. But it's still a hit. It's still let's stop and wait for memory, you know, kind of thing. So you get a lot of fault, you know, even if you get uh, if I have I know you need both of these to be atomic. If I'm writing to nah, I'll stop saying that. I don't know, you get a lot of cases where you don't realize that the thing beside you is changing and it screws up your atomic. Like strong and weak rep counts would be one example where you could be hammering both of them. 
Yeah. And all, all you can do is you can bug your programming going, why, why is this not getting the throughput I want? You look at all your code and it's fine, and then you move these away from each other and suddenly it's, it's double the speed. Um, so, bonus question. We've got atomic T is implemented with locks when T is too big, right, to be natively atomic. Uh, locks use acquired release, but atomics give you sequential consistency. So, how do you implement sequential consistency given only acquired release? You know, maybe all your atomics are based on acquired release locks, but yet you have to offer sequential consistency. And note that just acquired plus release is not always the same as sequential consistency. And this was the example, right? Acquired release is not the same as sequential consistency. So now let's take a look at this and say, what if all these atomics are written with locks? How do I make that sequentially consistent? Because all I've got to use are required release, yet I have to come up with sequential consistency. So, I'll leave that as the bonus question. If you can't solve that problem, step away, don't. I, I mean, up until this morning talking to Dave, I wasn't sure, I couldn't remember, partially couldn't remember and partially couldn't figure out how one solution to that. Um, but um, I, I should mention, this is not the last slide I'm stealing from Michael. I'm also stealing this slide from Michael <laughs> to point out that he stole slides from other people and also that I'm stealing slides from other people. Um, and I stole stuff from Michael, Hans, this guy who I don't know, Bartosz, who's here, Anthony Williams. And, and go, to, go to his blog here and see the discussion between these three guys on, you know, here's three experts on lock programming, as much as you can be an expert on it. Um, trying to decide how a Peterson lock has to work, right? It's like, Peterson locks are tiny. There's like, you know, four lines of code. And yet, the, the one thing he, he was doing actually caused a change in the standard to, to get it right. Um, and I stole some pictures from these guys. And finally, these locks. Um, and I'll, I'll finish off with this. It's too much reading, but People can read while they ask questions. Are you going to put your slide on that GitHub? Yep. Um, I, I, I was exporting it as PDF and stuff. It doesn't work as anything except for PowerPoint because it's got all the animation crap in it. Otherwise, you get PDFs of like all the objects slammed on top of each other. So it'll be, a, it'll be a PowerPoint. Um, the only thing I want to amend this is teach yourself atomics in, in 21 days. It's even worse than that. Um, and I think that's the last one. Oh, yes. Questions? Everything made complete sense, right? <laughs> or everything, nothing made sense, which is kind of what I wanted. Not try to do any of the